här på Globala torget scen på bokmässan i Göteborg. Vi har precis fått lite härlig musik från, eh, av en egyptisk eh, sångare. Nu ska vi ta upp ett eh, problem, ett fenomen som är mycket allvarligt och som förhindrar eh, en, en rättvis och demokratisk utveckling i stora delar av världen, nämligen korruption. Och det är, Svenska kyrkan, Se Människan och eh, Fujo som är arrangörer av det här. Louise Lindfors som är generalsekreterare på Afrikagrupperna kommer att leda det här samtalet med Sylvia Wollenhofen och Nirel Tols Tolsi. Förlåt mig. Så att eh, samtalet kommer att föras på engelska. Så so please go ahead. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you very much for that introduction uh, and warm welcome to my distinguished guests. Uh, this is, as you heard, a seminar about uh, corruption. It's a very difficult subject and we will try to browse through it and penetrate it the best we, to our best effort. Uh, my name is Louise Limfors. I'm Secretary General for Afrika Gruppena, a Swedish solidarity organization. We have been working in uh, the southern parts of Africa and, and we have an office in South Africa for almost 50 years. Uh, and we will come back to that, the solidarity movement, the people-to-people -people power, and, and what's at stake when it comes to corruption. But I would like to start with introducing these amazing panelists. Uh, we have two very sharp journalists and also artists, I would say. Uh, and I have asked them to to just make introductions a little bit more full uh, as for you to enjoy the sort of uh, um, complexity that you come with to the table because, as mentioned, you are not just journalists. Uh, so I will hand over to you for introductions and we'll penetrate the subject a little bit more later. But please, uh, Sylvia, would you like to start? Okay, it's not often I get asked to follow an Egyptian guitarist singer, so I'm going to try my best, okay? Um, I'm a journalist, and I've been, first of all, a print journalist, and then later on a television journalist and filmmaker. I'm also a writer, playwright, and a lecturer, professor of practice at the University of Johannesburg. And my, I've been very fortunate because my journalism has spanned. No, sir, with the mic. Oh, my journalism has spanned from the apartheid era. I was born in the 50s, right through the, from the start of apartheid to the end, and then into the new South Africa, which has been an extremely e exciting period to be a South African. So I look forward to having this conversation with you this afternoon. Um, I'm uh, hello. I'm. My name's Niren. Um, I'm a I'm a writer. So okay, Niren. So yeah. both of you, you need to think like rock stars. Keep the mic like this. Very then close. They will hear you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Here we go. Thank you. Um, very very close. Um, yeah. Um, I'm a journalist from South Africa. I'm a writer, so I very rarely like to speak. Um, so this is novel. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I I've been working on very various projects, which which usually entails slow journalism. Uh, an example, um, there was a massacre that happened in South Africa 10 years ago in August where the police killed 34 striking mine workers um, and 10 people had died in the week before the massacre including policemen, non-striking mine workers, um, security guards employed by the, by the company and striking mine workers. Um, so I've been working with a photographer for the past 10 years documenting what happens afterwards to both the families of the of, of the 44 men who were killed, but also um, the country and our democracy, um, and how some of those, some of the problems that were highlighted, and the lack of reform with those problems that led, that led to the massacre, still feed into and infiltrate our our constitutional democracy now, and what it means in terms of um, an inability to for progressive development. I suppose, yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. You're already touching upon on the sort of uh, context that we will go into in this complicated area of cor corruption. Uh, we have both, we need to, to think about history, we need to think about different levels in society, we need to think about culture uh, in a way, in a sense, uh, and uh, about the human possibilities and also uh, challenges when it comes to 
to this phenomena. So I thought we'd start with some kind of context analysis. What, it, what, it, what is corruption? We use it, we use the word uh, kind of, um, you know, often, uh, without even considering the different levels of, of what it actually is. And uh, one might think it has to do with, with money, um, mainly, that it's centered around money. But there are so many other values at stake, and it's a phenomena that sort of uh, gets into your system and your body uh, almost. And we will talk about that kind of also what it what what's at stake, what we need to do, how we need to address it, like this kind of trauma healing. We will uh, talk about for society and for individuals. Uh, but if we start, uh, Niran, you, you mentioned uh, actually the constitution and South Africa has one of the most progressive and strongest when it comes to human rights and democracy constitutions in the world. And yet it's, it's one of the most unequal countries. Uh, what, what would you say? What is your reflection on corruption and what, how, do you, how do you navigate uh, in that context in your work? Um, you know, it's, it, it's very interesting. Um, the inequality, um, there's, there's certainly a sense of an anti-democratic and anti-constitutional um, impulse that is, that is taking over a lot of the country, which is linked to inequality. And it has, um, I suppose it is the, the makers of power and the holders of power have deflected away from their own political failures, in, in South Africa especially. And, and we've reached a point now where, where we blame the constitution and democracy for a lot of these failures, which are political failures, i.e., uh, you know, the, a lack of service delivery, a lack of uh, job creation, um, an inability to, to, to or almost a, a rejection of, of, of the progressive need to, to change society, to make, to create a more egalitarian society. Um, and I'll give you an example. So, um, in July last year, there were a series of what 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 we would call um, an insurrection, where there were a series of riots in South Africa in response to our former president being ordered by the Constitutional Court to, to spend time in jail for being in contempt of court for not making himself available before um, a judicial inquiry into state capture, which is um, a formalized f form of, of corruption in South Africa where state institutions have been, have been captured, uh, have been hollowed out, or have been used, or have been repurposed to, to to, to feed the needs of a very small oligarchic minority. So um, what happened when, 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 when former President Jacob Zuma um, was ordered to go to prison, and he, when he did turn him, himself into prison, um, his, net, his, almost, his shadow state network of spies and people who have, I suppose, who've, who've bought into this idea of, of, of corrupt practice rather than democratic practice, um, triggered themselves into action, where they, they blocked off the, ma the main arterial roads in our country, where they um, uh, looted uh, various shopping malls and, and led to over 300 deaths. Um, and what is, and so following that, we, I'd spent a bit of time uh, with a group of journalists in a place called Moy River, which has always been, which is on the N3 between Durban, our major port, and Johannesburg, which is our major economic hub. Um, and uh, that area has always had um, trucks being burnt and looted at the toll plaza there. Um, what transpires, though, is that this has been happening for several years, and essentially there have been uh, preparations for this kind of event. And, um, and I, I'd spent time in the community, and what was staggering was that a lot of people, even the young people or older people, older people with social, socially conservative morals, and young people who had never known apartheid but do know this corrupted idea of democracy would blame democracy and the constitution for failing them, not their political leaders. Um, and it was, yeah, it was, it, it was a stark moment for me, I think, because what is also happening is that the political mainstream are using social media to, 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 to push this anti-constitutional agenda, almost in an attempt to, I suppose, replicate our, our apartheid past, which is authoritarian, which is above the rule of law, which is without a constitution, which is about a small network, coterie of people um, being above the law, as, as, our, as our former president would like to be. So, yeah. Um. 
Yes, we will come back also to the role of, of the young people, yeah. since this is something very crucial to, to the solutions that we hopefully will get to by the end of this conversation. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I, I was also uh, so shocked and mesmerized by all these events and the loots and, and the deaths. And it, it, it's definitely something, it's a symptom that um, yeah, the lack of trust has got so many different shadows. Well, well I mean, you know, I, I, I was speaking to, to people in their early 30s. I mean, they would have been very young when apartheid ended. Um, but who've never worked a day in their life. And at some point, you know, the, the idea that the only way to, to get ahead, to put food on the table, is to act in a way which is anti-democratic, which is um, outside the rule of law. Mm -hmm. And that is something that is really emerging in South Africa right now, which is a very worrying, I think, context in which our, our state, in, in, against which we, we exist. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the young people have both the responsibility and the sort of <laughs> very heavy weight on their shoulders, but yet maybe some lack of, of historical reference and, and, and their own memory, so to speak. I think, yeah, I think my generation and, and those before us are perhaps are failing the youth, especially the political mainstream. Mm. Sylvia, you have uh, addressed both inheriting trauma and, and trying to heal from, from gener both generational trauma, you have also centered around, of course, the role of women, uh, but you have also talked about that we mustn't forget the longer history and, and to, to talk about, yeah, this was the years of apartheid, etc. but we also need to recognize the hundreds of years of colonialism and, and what's it doing, what is it, what's been implemented in, in the people, so to say, what are your reflections in this area when it comes to, to corruption and also maybe, uh, yeah, in a more societal level? I, yes, thank you, Louise. I, I think when you started and you talked about just the very meaning of the word corruption, I think that's, that's extremely important because what we're looking at, but not just in South Africa, in the world in general, is systems that are, it's almost endemic corruption, you know. In South Africa, you have overt corruption, you have systemic corruption, and then you have the endemic corruption of the past. Things that we've inherited in the body politic that is just so diseased that we can't transform it. And so, but I think when you look at us as a global family of nations, more and more in powerful nations, people are sending strong messages that says we support the undermining of basic human values. We support the fact that there is the other that can be dehumanized. We support the fact that people with the means and with the privilege can do what they like and have immunity um, from behaving like normal, decent human beings. And so when that is the global message coming from strong and powerful countries, a country like South Africa, of course there's reverberations. So we don't, we're not just having the fallout and the heritage of apartheid and hundreds and hundreds of years of colonialism. We're having the fallout of what is happening in the world in general, which impacts on a developing nation and which which comes to the fore in a simple act like, you know, in the beginning, um, post-1994, in the early years of our democracy, there was a huge arms scandal that came to light um, sometime later. Sweden was implicit in that arms scandal, trying to sell us helicopters that we didn't need at prices that we definitely couldn't afford. So in this matter of corruption, there is a global context, and then when there is a corruptee, there is a corrupter, you know. South Africa is especially vulnerable because it e has rich resources and is one of the richest countries on, on the African continent. But we're not doing this corruption thing all on our own. We're not just quietly sitting there saying, hey, listen, we're going to be corrupt. You know, we've got a rich country, let's steal it dry. No, we are, we are behaving as human beings within the context of what is happening in the world. And so if we are to address the problem of corruption in South Africa, we need friendly nations and rich countries to sit together with us around the table and say, we commit to something. The South African government, apartheid government, didn't fall because they decided one day, oh, this is the wrong thing to do, we should stop doing it. 
the apartheid came to an end because the world would not tolerate it. Apartheid was the huge, the huge corruption of that system became intolerable for the world. It also came to an end because South Africans inside and outside decided it must end and, and that they would not tolerate it. So if, South, if corruption in South Africa has to come to an end, as a global family of nations, we have to decide what can be done about it and we have to understand that we are all implicit in it. Indeed, it's, it's a very intricate subject because, as, as you mentioned, it's sort of embodied in so many different ways. Uh, you have now touched upon also the, the political aspects of this and I would like to get back to the role of the youth because, as you're mentioning, uh, there is this, you can see this sort of symptom of lack of trust uh, for young people. Also. Uh, both in, in, in government, but also in democracy as, a, as an idea, as a tool, as a possibility. Um, and and uh, it gets violent, of course. It, it uh, turns out to, to not only corrupt the society, but also to, to sort of yeah, burst out in, in violent uh, expression. What would you say is the role of the youth and how, uh, because I know you work a lot uh, with this, uh, what ways do you find and what conversations can we have uh, to address this and, and to build the trust? <laughs> I, th I, I think it's both a, a philosophical conversation but also a conversation about material, materiality, material change to people's lives and how one does that. And I'm, I, I, look, it's been a very long year, it's been the 10th anniversary of the Marikana massacre, so I'm in a very nihilistic space at the moment. Uh, um, and uh, material change can only come through political will. Um, and uh, and I'm, I, I'm, it feels, may, maybe this is a point that we, we can develop a little bit later, but it, it feels like what needs to happen, you know, the conversation in South Africa is very much around state capture. Um, the formal capture of government um, government departments, of uh, uh, parastatals, the hollowing out of institutions, etc. And, um, and, and, I, and I do wonder whether this conversation around maybe ensuring material change so that people realize that it is not democracy, the idea of democracy that is, not, that is failing them, but it is the politicians. And I think people realize this, but the, but, but the problem, problem is people realize that, that corruption is wrong. But, and I'll give you an example. So I've been wor I was working in an area um, to the west of Johannesburg a few years ago. And um, I was, de so essentially the community there had skilled themselves to the point where they were able to read budgets, the, uh, municipal budgets. They were able to read um, uh, IDPs, integrated development plans that the municipality had le set out to, to change their lives. So they were holding the municipality to account in terms of saying, but hey, in this, in this year's budget, you're supposed to build roads, but you have not built this, these roads. What's happened, right? And so I'd worked with, 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 with very well-meaning community members, but at some point, one of my sources, one of my contacts, he stopped returning my calls. He stopped um, uh, feeding me information. And then I found out from his comrades that actually, he had, he'd, he'd reached a point where he was tired of living in a shack in his mother's backyard. He was tired of, of, of his nascent business not developing anywhere because he needed to know somebody to pay to get even a small tender from a contract from the municipality. So eventually he'd flip to the other side. And, and a lot of right-minded South Africans figure that at some point, because democracy is failing all around them, because policies and programs are not being implemented, uh, and we can come back to why that is happening and, and this confluence between the state and the ruling party, and, which I think is an important thing to, to look at. Um, because these things aren't happening, and this is, a, this is a solid human being. He's now flipped over to the other side and he's decided, well, I'm I, if I can't beat them, I've got to join them. And, and that, I figure, is something that's, that's occurring more and more in South Africa, where people realize I'm 20, uh, 25 years old, I've got a university degree, I can't get a job, my mother doesn't have food on the table, what am I going to do? If an agent provocateur comes to me and says, we're going to set fire to these trucks at the toll, toll gate on a certain date, you just have to go and loot. People, young people have told me, that's what we will do because we want to put food on my grandmother's table. 
You know, so um, I've forgotten your question, but I... <laughs> no, it, it was around exactly that in sentiment, like where are we at and what can you do and, and the, the, the role of the, the young in this. But you mentioned now also the, the political aspect, and I think we'll go into that a little bit deeper because it's one of the main obstacles, of course, and it's also one of the challenges when it comes to to actually talking about corruption, <laughs> of course. Uh, I mean, also when it comes to the trust to, to entities, to institutions, we want to elaborate and, and sort of put light on, on the, the bad, so to say, but we still also need to, to build the trust at the same time. So these are two flip side of the coins, like how can we do this simultaneously? How can, how can we do both things at the same time? Uh, Sylvia, would you like to say something about the, the sort of, what's the politics at stake? And, uh, and of course in, in South Africa then, uh, when it comes to corruption. I think the, the politics, in order to examine the politics, we must look at our political systems, and, and not just in South Africa. I find it remarkable that generally in the world there have been huge strides, huge progress we've made, let's say, in medicine and science and aeronautics and, and um, quantum physics, but the political systems are creaking and aged and old and geriatric, and there hasn't been the same kind of brilliant human bra brains and, and minds put to work to revamp our political systems, to bring them more in line. So, so people are getting their information in completely different ways. People's social political choices are being made with a whole range of different influences, let's say, than 100 years ago. We're still trying to use the same democratic systems that we used 100 years ago, and they are failing us. And so what we're seeing in a state like South Africa, which is very, very vulnerable given its history and especially its recent past, is trying to pretend that this system of democracy, the way we've inherited, especially the Westminster system we inherited from the Brits, is working. It's not working. It is hopelessly inadequate, you know? And some days I think to myself, the old-fashioned African system of chiefs is much better if the chief is a great person, man or woman you know, we'd be better off. And, and so I just think that we need to step back a bit and re-examine the political systems that we are so doggedly using decade after decade. I mean, if you just look at what has just happened in Sweden, so you scare enough people, make them so, so frightened that they completely move to the political right um, and closer towards fascism. And if as many people decide they want to be fascist as possible, that's the kind of system you're going to have. Up to very recently, we thought this was unthinkable in a place like Sweden, and now here you sit with this reality. But what is good about it is that it reminds the world that if this can happen in Sweden, that's, that's a reflection of the state of the world right now. So South Africa has to, like any other country in the world, has to seriously look at this kind of political system that we're implementing because, first of all, the, 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 the people who are rising to the top into powerful positions are not the best. You know, if I have money for my child to go to university, I definitely don't want to waste it on making them become a politician. People with brains and great education are not going into politics. So you're getting the bottom of the barrel ruling the world. I mean, what kind of crappy medieval system is that? I, I've got to agree with uh, Sylvia. I think, I mean, um, liberal democracy, especially in the clutches of late capitalism, has, fa is fail, has failed. And I'll give you an example which is directly linked to, to, Lon, uh, to the Marikana massacre. Now, um, and so in 2005, um, the workers, the mine workers at Lonman, which was the, the multinational which was running the platinum mining operation uh, in, in the northwest province at Marikana, um, was set to have a deal, to, to set, set to allow, I think, a, a percentage stake around 15%, which was supposed to go to the mine workers, right, as part of the black economic empowerment deal. What happens is that uh, the mine workers get shifted aside, and that, and that percentage of black ownership goes to our current president, Cyril Ramaphosa, and his, and his company, right? Um, and they do this, and we, we come, coming back to the idea of, of, of reimagining what corruption is, right? They do this because of, for political recipro reciprocity. Um, 
essentially what they figure is that to have somebody who's high up in the ANC who can pull the levers of power when it comes to the ANC and the governing party is more important for them than to give a share to their mine workers. And what happens in 2012, a few years later, after Mr. Ramaphosa admits at the, Farlam, at the Marikana Commission that he's never read, his only job as, as, as a, as a non-executive director was to read the transformation reports that were coming up, which, which show whether uh, the company has been abiding by its social and labor plans to ensure a transformation of our migrant labor system, right? They were supposed to build 5,500 family houses for their mine workers in six years, by 2011, to ensure that uh, because in South Africa, mining is very much based on migrant labor. What you have are mine, black mine workers, units of labor, who, who, who see their families twice a year in their rural homes because they're working all the time. They see them over Christmas and over, over Easter. Now, Mr. Ramaphosa, who has a background, he started the biggest, trade, uh, biggest mining trade union in South Africa, the National Union of Mine Workers in the 80s, right? Now, he, doesn't, he under cross-examination, admits that he didn't read a single development report which showed that between 2005, when Lonman make the pledge to, to build these 5,500 houses, and 2011, when they have only built three of these 5,500 5, houses, he has not read a single one of these reports which show that they have not fulfilled their social and labor plans, which are a requirement for Lonman to, to maintain their mining license. So that's the first point. The second point is when the strike escalates in terms of violence, right? Mr. Ramaphosa is calling, um, he's calling the Minister of Police, he's calling the Minister of Mines, and he's telling, he's telling them, uh, the, the Minister of Police, especially in an email, he says, we demand concomitant action for the deaths that have happened already. Now this is the toxic nexus of, of capitalism, of, uh, of politics, which essentially is there to for what, excuse my French, to fuck the working class. Now, and so, so how do you deal, when, when, when somebody with that kind of background, who, who has started the biggest mining union in the country, cares not for the lives of mine workers in 2012, what does it say about the nature of democracy? And also, I mean, yeah, that, 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 that redefinition of corruption, I suppose, you know? What are you getting? You may, it may not be an exchange for money at that particular point, but it is an exchange for political leverage and power at a, at a, at a, at a later point, yeah. I'm so thankful for these contributions and that, that we're actually starting to, as you're saying, reimagine corruption. Uh, and maybe that's also the sort of what we need to do for the future when it comes to reimagining uh, democracy or, or politics, in a sense, uh, to sort of go about this, this failure uh, of, of liberal democracy and, and to, to address these very interlinked dysfunctional system as patriarchy and capitalism and, and the drain of uh, nature resources and, and resources, uh, also human resources in a sense. Um, Sylvia, if we are moving towards the light in the tunnel, where are we going and how do we get there? Um, I'm thinking you have written a lot about intersectionalism and trying to, to, to promote the, the, the feminist <laughs> agenda in a, in a sense. I'm also thinking about our work as civil society. We promote eco-feminism. We try to reimagine values and how can we live in a, in a just transition for real, not only uh, as uh, headings of, of different reports in the UN. <laughs> how, how can we as society, as civil society, but also as people um, address corruption and, and perhaps its other sort of linked symptoms that we have addressed uh, in this conversation? Whenever our people ask me this question about the light at the end of the tunnel, I feel very intimidated. <laughs> you feel I don't like you're going to die. No, <laughs> I'm no, sorry for no. The image. I, I, yeah, I, I almost died once, and there is a light. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> wow, we can have another seminar about that. Yeah. Thank were, you. <laughs> were you taking acid at the time? <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Um, so I just can answer this in a very personal way. I feel that when we look at the corrupt leadership, when we look at the failure of, of leadership around the world, there are major options available for us because clearly in, in many of our countries and definitely in many African countries, um, leadership has, has failed the people. And the people who always suffer the most are women and children who tend to be right at the bottom of that, that pressurized pile. But generally, the pressure is being felt keenly by working classes and, 
and, and the middle class people around the world. And so you, you find these really difficult political choices that, that people are making. For me personally, the light literally comes from looking at what the artists are saying. Pre pressurizing my government and you, we need to pressurize governments around the world to support the arts in a much more vigorous fashion because when political leadership has failed us you can always look at, at the visionary artists that we have and we will have those talents among us to, to kind of point a way out of, of the madness. And, and not just, you know, arts in all its, in, its glory, but in, in Africa, the other thing that we take very seriously side by side with our artists is, is spiritual systems, ancient spiritual systems, as well as the modern ones that we are developing. Because, um, you know, I've, I've been coming and going to Sweden for many years since, since the 80s. And one of the first things that, that struck me about Sweden as a young, fairly cynical, aggressive, go-getter journalist in the 80s when I came here for the first time was this complete lack of religion. I thought that was absolutely fabulous. <laughs> I, I just thought religion swept across the world and kind of bypassed the Nordic countries. Isn't that amazing? But, you know, it would be amazing if there was some vestiges or some um, remnants left over of what existed before the silliness of Christianity. And, and so I, I think that what we are very much rediscovering, re-exploring in Africa and definitely in Southern Africa is looking at ancient African spiritual systems and not just, you know, turning back and being um, kind of retro and, and hauling into the present everything because things are going hard here right now. Let's go and fetch some stuff to burn. But looking at what served us in the past and using it in the present so that we become much more balanced. We became very disconnected as modern people, disconnected from our higher selves. And, and we, we go about pretending that that's cool, that's, that's what it means to be urban. We can't in the workplace talk about this, we can't professionally talk about this. And so we walk around completely disconnected and we look and behave like disabled people. And so in a, to enable ourselves, we need to reconnect with the things that matter and stop trying to find intellectual solutions to things that are basically spiritual problems. Beautiful, <laughs> thank you. Yes, it's worth an applause. The holistic approach. Um, what do you say, Nir uh, Niran? Do you um, have I don't have <laughs> Sylvia's, Sylvia's, <laughs> Sylvia's poetry, um, but I think mine, mine is perhaps a bit more rooted in my own experience, especially of ju what happened in July last year in South Africa during the writing and the looting. Um, you know, I think for me, I was in KZN when, the, when, 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 when things went up in flames. Um, I was a few streets, my parents, I was living with my parents a few streets away from, from the violence. Um, and it made me, it, it, it took me and my, my family back to 1949 when there were race programs in South Africa um, and, and uh, it made clear that there was a line drawn in the sand of my country. There are either people who, are, who want to build South Africa, and there are those who are willing to destroy it for their own very narrow interest. And then Lenin's pestilential question arises, what is to be done? Um, for me, I think it is about accepting that state capture is the nature of liberal democracy, whether it is some, a, a, a certain a capitalist faction or another one that, one that will control the politicians who are in charge. Um, and then if we imagine state capture as being the only way to control the state, then is it not time for a popular front, a, a, a popular alliance amongst right-thinking right South Africans, from social movements to academics to bureaucrats to people who've been pushed to the sidelines because of these corrupt uh, projects, to come together and say, we have the means to capture the state ourselves. We have the, the, the knowledge and the background to, to provide a minister of education who is progressive, who will ensure that corruption does not happen. That may be, and I, and I take, and I take, um, I, I take uh, optimism, even in my very nihilistic moment, from, from places like what happened in Sri Lanka, from the Occupy movement, from these popular 
moments of, of, of people rising up and saying enough in, is enough and not in my name. And I think that is something that we need to, to, to light the fire. That's, that's where we need to light a fire and say not in our name and what is to be done. Yeah. And not leave it to the professional politicians. Stort oh. Jelic. It's the Lenin <laughs> quote. Oh, yeah, yeah. What, what can we do? Uh, what shall we do? What is to be done? Uh, I think you covered some uh, aspects of what can be done and also uh, shared so much interesting things on, on the actual problem as, as we tried to, to maneuver corruption in, in our specific way. And definitely there is a role for, for civil society, I would say. We need to step up as feminists and, and speak out and hopefully reinvent some kind of new populism then, <laughs> that is something else than that uh, more negative trend and, and mistrust that we see expression of uh, uh, and, and violence in, in society. But, yeah. No, I, was, I was just going to say, but I mean, the agency lies with the left and, and from where I stand, I mean, the left, the right can always come together and say, fuck the poor. Whereas the left is always fighting, it's always fragmented and we need, uh, as progressive people, we need to figure a way to bring the left together, and that has always been the burden of the left for as long you know, as progressive values have, uh, have existed. You know? mm. and, yeah. We will thank you both now on this stage, but uh, I can also recommend that those of you who want to... I know that Sylvia have some books that are uh, for sale, two books. Uh, at the t uh, what, wh where was it? At the tea? It's at the English bookstore, and they have a little table just over here. The two books. The one is a very personal uh, experience, creative nonfiction, called the Keeper of the Kum. Kum is a word for story in one of the African languages. So the keepers of stories, and it's about spirituality and tradition and politics and war and my relationship with Sweden and a whole lot of other things. And then uh, another book called Rethinking Africa, Indigenous Women Reinterpreting Southern Africa's Past, in which I've, I've written the, the, the opening chapter. So please feel free to go and get copies of it. And thank you very much. And I just want to end by saying I have a very, very special place in my heart for Sweden. So I, I hope that these recent twists and turns in your political development doesn't mean that, that Sweden is busy stepping down from, from its role in the world, which I think in terms of humanitarian values is a very important role. Thank you very much. We will have a conversation about that tomorrow at this stage, 9.15, uh, about the political state and the development cooperation at stake here in Sweden. Thank you so much for coming and thank you for all the amazing thank sharing you. you've done. Thank you.